Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Joseph and his family. We're up to Act 7. Where you, Joseph is now viceroy over all of Egypt. Pharaoh has appointed him to be the prime minister of all of Egypt. And Joseph understands that all of this is set up. All of these circumstances, all of these divine providences are set up for the com com completion of the prophecy of the dreams that he had way back when he was 17 years old. Joseph understood all along that the family will eventually have to come down to Egypt to buy food. Because the famine wasn't just in the land of Egypt, the famine was in the entire region, including the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. And he also understood all along that the original dreams would be fulfilled when this took place. He remembers the dreams of them bowing to him. He remembers the dreams of the stalks of wheat. Understand, all of this is now coming very clear to him what's going to happen here. So he implements laws in Egypt just so that he would be able to find out who was entering the country. He allowed immigration to take place. He allowed people from other countries to come to purchase food. However, he needed to approve anyone at the border. So you would have to stop at the border, pass over your ID, and it would go to Joseph's office to approve it to allow these people in. He made it seem because he was protecting Egypt from spies. But that's not really what he was doing. He wanted notification when his brothers would be arriving. And so he implements these laws knowing that this is all part of the prophecy that he received in the dream. Joseph understood that for the family to take their role in the world as this nation that will bring about a moral revolution in the world. And as God told Abraham, the mission would be to bring blessings to all the families on the face of the earth. Then they would need to get their own family in order first. <coughs> Excuse me. You can't be, be a nation whose job it is to bring blessings to all the families on the face of the earth when your family is in strife, when you're disunited, when there's hate within your own family. So this family must unite and must come together in a very powerful way in order for the next era, the mission statement of the Jews, to go from a family to a nation to go into effect. So merely for him to reveal himself and say, hey, guess who I am? I'm Joseph. <laughs> Look at me now. And they would say, oh, I'm so sorry. That's not going to cut it. We need something deeper. Joseph knows he needs to bring them to a level of repentance that is true, that is complete, that is deep, and that comes from the very depths of their hearts and souls. He needs to challenge them in a manner that will prove to all that they're not the same as the ones who threw them into a pit. Not just to prove to this family, but to prove to the world for all time. Because this story of Joseph is going to be recorded. It's going to be known. What happens here is critical, not just for this family now, but it's critical for the Jewish people for forever. Then and only then, if he's able to touch the core of their soul and bring about a total change in their character, can the mission move forward. So before there could be an exodus, before there could be a Sinai, before there could be a promised land, there needs to be a nation. And before there can be a nation, there needs to be a family. Up until now, in the entire book of Genesis, all the stories that we've been studying over the last few years in this biblical reflections course, starting from Adam and Eve, the family structure has not quite worked out too well. We've studied Cain and Abel. That didn't go well. Noah and his son Ham. That didn't go over well. Ishmael and Isaac. That didn't go over well. Jacob and Esau. That didn't go over well. And Joseph and his brothers. That didn't go over well. For those saying that the sound is low, is it better now? If someone could, uh, on the chat, just tell me if the sound is better. 
Okay. Don't all shout at once, as they say. <laughs> Easy for me to say. I muted all of you. Um, but hopefully it's, it's coming across better now. Thank you. Thank you. We need to bring about a change here, and Joseph has a plan. It won't be easy. It can easily backfire. It will bring about some pain and some discomfort, but it's the only way. He will use the advantage that he knew who they were, but they didn't know who he was. They thought of him as a hostile dictator. They thought they were being punished by God for the sin that they committed against their brother. They didn't know who this man really was, as the story will unfold. But Joseph was waiting for them. He knew who he was looking for. Let's take a look in chapter 42. And let's go through the chapter verse by verse. I'll share the screen with you so you can see it. And let's see how this story unfolds. Verse 1. Jacob saw that there was grain being sold in Egypt. So Jacob says to his sons, why do you appear satiated? Hey, you know where there's a crisis here. There's no food. We got to buy food. There's food in Egypt. And he said, behold, I have heard that there's grain being sold in Egypt. Go down there and buy us some from there so that we will live and not die. Verse 3. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. And the commentaries point out, it's interesting that they're called here in verse 3, Joseph's ten brothers. Why not Jacob's children? Jacob was addressing his sons. And verse 3 is telling us that his sons listened to him. So the him here is Jacob. Why is it Joseph's ten brothers went down? Why not Jacob's children went down? And they're called Joseph's brothers because the commentaries explain to us that what the verse is telling us, that on their mind, they're thinking Joseph. This will be the first time that they're entering Egypt after they sold Joseph as a slave to Egypt. And they saw the suffering that this brought upon their father. And they were determined as, hey, if we're going down to Egypt anyway, maybe we look for him. Maybe we try to find him. Maybe we try to buy him back. And we bring him back to his father. So they're thinking Joseph, Joseph's ten brothers, because as they're going down to Egypt, they're saying, you know what? Maybe it's time we look for him. Maybe he is alive. Maybe we can redeem him and bring him home. Verse 4. But Joseph's brother Benjamin, Jacob did not send with his brothers because he said, lest misfortune befall him. Now, Benjamin is not a baby. He's 30 years old. He's married. He has many children. But Jacob won't let him leave his sight. Because the last son of Rachel that he sent on an errand didn't come back. Rachel, the wife that he loved so much, only had two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. He wasn't going to take a chance and let Benjamin leave his side. And so Benjamin, the sole survivor of Rachel, remains at Jacob's side. So there's a total of 12 sons, 10 go down to Egypt. Benjamin stays with Jacob, and we know where Joseph was, but the ten brothers don't know where Joseph was. Verse 5, So the sons of Israel came to purchase among those who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now they're called the sons of Israel, the children of Israel. By the way, if you look closely in the text of the Bible, this will be the first time that they're called B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel. Nationhood is getting ready to begin. Verse number 6. Now Joseph was the ruler over the land, and it was he who sold grain to the entire populace of the land. And Joseph's brothers came, and they prostrated themselves to him with their faces to the ground. Heh. Talk about dreams. Talk about fulfillment of dreams. 
immediately they come, and this is the prime minister, this is the one who's the boss, he's the one that's going to decide how much food we can buy, and they immediately show respect by bowing. And it's interesting, what is it, we understand that Joseph needs to approve the immigration list, but here we clearly see that if a large group came specifically from the land of Canaan, Joseph ordered that they can only do the transaction with him. They can't buy it from any other salesperson. It has to be from him, again, setting this up so that he would force this confrontation. He would force this uh, seeing his own brothers face to face. Verse number 7. And Joseph saw his brothers. Right away he knew it was them. And he recognized them. But he made himself a stranger to them, and he spoke to them harshly. And he said to them, Where do you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan to purchase food. Now I want to point this out to you because Joseph will be harsh for the next three chapters. He's going to be harsh on his brothers. But you should not make the mistake to think that this is about revenge. It's never going to be about revenge. It's about making sure that the repentance is real and the forgiveness is real. As I mentioned, the family has to change before it can take on the role and the mission that God has in mind for it. Verse number 8. Now Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed about them. And he said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. Immediately he accuses them of being spies. Verse 10. And they said to him, No, my master, your servants have come to buy food. We're not spies. Verse 11. We are all sons of one man. We're honest. Your servants were never spies. But he said to them, No, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. What is this interrogation about? Joseph wants to know more. What do you think is really bothering him on this first encounter? Not just that it triggers, I'm sure, the memory of the last time he saw them. There's something else that's bothering Joseph. Who's missing? Benjamin is not there. He knows that Benjamin is not a little kid. He knows exactly how old Benjamin is. If Benjamin is 30 years old already, why isn't Benjamin here? Why are there 10 of them and not 11? What did they do to Benjamin? Remember, he has no family contact in the last, in all these years since he's gone. And so he begins to panic and to worry Did they not just get rid of me? Did they get rid of Benjamin as well? So Benjamin is so much on his mind. Why is he not with them? And so the interrogation begins. Verse 13. And they said, We, your servants, are twelve brothers. We're a family of twelve. The son of one man in the land of Canaan. We're one family. We're not spies. And behold... The youngest is with our father today, and one is gone. So he hears now two things in verse 13. Two things that give him some comfort. Number one, Benjamin is fine. Benjamin is home. What else does he pick up in verse 13 that he does not know yet? That his father is alive. Our youngest, the youngest, is with our father today. All of this is important news for Joseph. And notice how they talk about Joseph. One is gone. Okay? Verse number 14. And Joseph said to them, This is just what I have spoken to you, saying you are spies. With this you shall be tested. We'll see if you're honest with me. By Pharaoh's life, you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. I'm going to test you. If what you're saying is true, that there's a younger brother, but he's in the land of Canaan, fine. Go send for him. Verse 16, send one of you and let him fetch your brother. 
and you will be imprisoned up until he comes here so that your words will be tested where the truth is with you and if not as Pharaoh lives they swear in the name of Pharaoh you are spies in verse 17 he immediately puts them in prison for three days on the third day Joseph says to them do this and live for I fear God if you are honest your one brother will be confined in your prison and you go bring the grain for the hunger of your households so he says to them in verse 19 listen I'm a God-fearing man I want to do this fairly and justly but I need to protect my country because I think you're spies so instead of making all of you stay in prison until Benjamin comes back I'm gonna change the rules one of you will remain hostage here one of you will stay in prison here the rest of you can go back home and when you come back here and Benjamin is with you I'll release the one that's in prison here too not only that I care about your wives and your children back in the land of Canaan so it's important that you get home now because they're probably out of food so I'm gonna give you the food for your households now you'll bring the food back I'm gonna leave one of you here in prison you come back with Benjamin and we're fine I want you the audience to think to understand that Joseph is setting them up everything he's doing here he has a plan and he's setting them up for what he wants to be the final test verse 20 and bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and you will not die and they did so and Ruvain answered them saying so now we have the statement of of Ruvain see as this is all going on as this conversation is going on the brothers begin to think to themselves why is this happening to us why is this happening to us and they reach the conclusion that this has to be some way connected to Joseph some sort of punishment for the ill treatment that they have to a Joseph they're being punished for what they did it's interesting that they don't blame they don't blame the wicked viceroy they're men of faith and they know that if this is happening to them it's not because of the viceroy it's because of God and it must be something on high that's happening let's look at verse 21 and they said to one another indeed we are guilty for our brother that we witness the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen this is why this trouble has come upon us so they're talking to each other in Hebrew thinking Joseph this Egyptian has no idea what we're saying Joseph is able to obviously understand everything because he speaks Hebrew as well they're talking to one another and pay close attention to their words they say we are guilty for what we did to our brother okay we're starting we're starting we're getting somewhere there's an element of them acknowledging that they're guilty but know what they say what is it that they're guilty of they say because we witnessed the distress of his soul when he begged us so when we threw him into a pit he begged us to take him out of there and when we sold him as a slave he begged us not to do it and we didn't listen what's missing what's missing here is why did you do this in the first place why did you throw him in the pit forget the begging why did you sell him as a slave forget the begging they are still convinced as if we get to chapter 42 verse 21 they're still convinced that Joseph was a wicked brother and that Joseph needed to be dealt with that's not where they think they were guilty for that they think they were justified they were only guilty because when he was begging us not to do it perhaps perhaps we should have allowed him to ask for forgiveness for his wicked ways that's all it's a step 
but it's just the first step. It's acknowledging that they're being punished, but they still don't get it. They still think what they did was right, but when he begged us and he cried to us, we should have had Rachmanis. We should have had more pity. So Reuven says to them, remember Reuven was the one that wanted to save Joseph all along. And Reuven was never comfortable with this. And Reuven perhaps was, def- was not there when he was sold as a slave. And Reuven is the firstborn, he's the oldest. So he turns to his brother here, in the presence of this prime minister that he thinks does not understand the word he's saying. And he says to them, didn't I tell you do not sin against this lad? But you didn't listen to me. And behold, his blood too is being demanded. Hey, I told you then, don't touch him. And you guys didn't listen. You should have listened to me then. Verse 23. They did not know that Joseph understood. For the interpreter was between them. Joseph, at all times when he was interacting with them, he kept this interpreter there just to put up the charade that he doesn't understand. So if the interpreter is not there, these guys feel safe talking. It's like some of you have parents that spoke in Yiddish and they didn't think you understood a word, so they speak in front of you in Yiddish because you don't know what they're talking about. Parents like doing that, speaking a different language so that you wouldn't understand. Well, that's what they're doing here, thinking the prime minister doesn't know what we're talking about. They're having this conversation amongst themselves, feeling guilty, and Reuven really lays into them. Verse 24 shows us a little bit about Joseph's personality. He turns away from them and he wept. He hears this. He hears the beginning of the repentance, and he hears Reuven saying, Hey, I told you then not to touch the lad. For Joseph to now know that at least his oldest brother was against this, wasn't in on it, warned the others not to do this, that that gives him some, some comfort, some emotion, and he begins to cry. We're going to find Joseph crying perhaps more than any other biblical character. He's a very emotional character, especially because he's lived through this, he's gone through this, and all of this emotion has been remaining, staying with him the entire time. And now he's hearing this. So he turns away and he wept. And then he returned to them and spoke to them. He took Shimon from among them and imprisoned him before their eyes. So he selected the one that he wants to keep, and he selects Shimon. According to all commentary, Shimon was the most hot-headed when it came to dealing with Joseph, and so he's imprisoning him. He also wants to separate the two brothers, Shimon and Levi, together. That tag team is a very dangerous team, so he separates them. But it's an interesting choice of words when it says, before their eyes. He imprisoned them before their eyes. And the commentaries say, That means when the family left, he took Shimon out of the prison and he put him in a room, in an apartment. So he didn't feel the entire time he was in prison. He was under house arrest, so to say. Verse 25. Again, everything Joseph's doing here is calculated. He's got a plan. Let's see what he does next. Verse 25. And Joseph commanded, and they filled their vessels with grain. He wanted them, all the vessels that they brought to take home with grain, fill it to the rim. And he commanded, this is his own staff, to return their money into each one's sack and to give them provisions for the journey, and he did so for them. So unbeknownst to the brothers, the brothers paid for all this food that they purchased. All the money that they paid for the food, Joseph had hidden putting it back into their sacks of wheat so that when they come home, they're going to see their money is back and it's just going to make them a little bit crazy. He's teasing them a little bit for them to be worried as to what is going on, what's going on here. And he also commanded that give them food for the trip. So he's being nice sometimes, and sometimes he's being, (laughs) I use the word cruel, but it's all part of his charade. Verse 26, and they loaded their grain upon their donkeys, and they went away from there, leaving Shimon behind. 
they feel they'll come home, they'll tell Jacob what happened, and we just have to go back one more time with Benjamin, and we're in the clear. All is good. Verse 27. The one opened his sack to give fodder to his donkey. On the way home, one of the donkeys was a little bit hungry. So one of the brothers say, no problem, Mr. Donkey, I got a lot of food with me. So he opens up his sack at the lodging place. And he sees all the money is there in the mouth of his sack. And he said to his brothers, verse 28, My money has been returned, and indeed here it is in my sack. And their hearts sank and trembling, and they turned to one another, saying, look at the line they say, What is this that God has done to us? Why is God messing with us? Why is he toying with us? What's their fear? Their fear is they're going to be accused of thievery. They're going to be accused of stealing the money or stealing the food. And they're afraid now. They're frightened. Now, at this point, they only think it's in one of their sacks. Once they get home and they're all going to open their sacks, they're going to see all of their sacks have their money in them. Verse 29, they came to Jacob, their father, to the land of Canaan, and they told them all that had befallen them, saying, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke to us harshly, and he accused us of spying the land. And we said to him, We are honest. We were never spies. Verse 32, We are twelve brothers, the sons of our father. One is gone, and today the youngest is with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, With this I will know that you are honest. Leave one of your brothers with me, and what is needed for the hunger of your households, take and go. And bring your youngest brother to me, so that I will know that you're not spies, that you are honest. Then I will give you your brother, and you may travel around the land. Once you do that, you have total freedom to keep coming into Egypt. You'll have an immigration card. You'll have a passport stamped by me that says you can come anytime. You can travel any part of the land of Egypt. Verse 35, it came to pass that they were emptying their sacks. Now they're home and they're all emptying their sacks. And behold, each one's bundle of money was in his sack. They saw the bundles of the money, they and their father, and they became frightened. So now they realize it's not just one guy. We all have our money back. Verse 36, And their father Jacob said to them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is gone. Shimon is gone. And you want to take Benjamin? All these troubles have come upon me. All I know is when I sent, and I sent Joseph to find you, he never came home. And now you come home and another brother is missing, Shimon, with some story. Last time you gave me a story of some coat dipped into blood. Now you're telling me a story of some viceroy who has Shimon hostage. I don't know your stories. But there's no way I'm sending Benjamin with you. He's a little suspicious here. Something is going on. He doesn't know what to make of this. First Joseph, now Shimon. I'm not taking chances with Benjamin. And Reuven spoke to his father saying, Hey, Dad, you may put my two sons to death if I don't bring Benjamin back to you. I guarantee Benjamin to come back with my own children. Put him into my hand and I will return him to you. It's a figure of speech that Reuven used, not the brightest figure of speech to use. You don't have to say that about Jacob's grandchildren. You could put your grandchildren to death if I don't follow through. But he wanted to convey to Jacob that he means it. You can trust me. Verse 38, But he, Jacob, said, My son shall not go down with you because his brother is dead, and he is alone, he alone is left. He's the only son left from Rachel. And if misfortune befalls him on the way you are go uh, on the way you are going, you will bring down my gray head in sorrow to the grave. So he's adamant that he will not do it. He will not allow Benjamin to go. And so, as this story begins to unfold, the story of now the brothers facing Joseph, 
we see that Joseph has this, he wants the brothers on their toes. He wants them worried. He wants them thinking, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? And he's going to build his plot. He's going to build it layer by layer by layer until he brings it to the conclusion that he wants to have. We're going to move on now to Act 8. Okay? Again, we're going to take a look in the text. This is now a few months later. <laughs> Jacob does not want to allow, he's adamant, he's not allowing Benjamin to go. And Shimon is stuck there in Egypt. And the brothers are in this tug of war with their father to try to convince their father, trust us, send Benjamin with us. Let's take a look at chapter 43. But the hunger was severe in the land. And it came to pass when they finished eating the grain that they had brought from Egypt. Remember, they brought back a lot of grain, but now after a few months, it's gone. And their father says, okay, you got to go back and get some more food. We're out of food. The pantry is empty. So now Judah is going to take the lead. At the end of the last chapter, at the end of chapter 42, Reuven took the lead. Now Judah's taking the lead. And Judah speaks up and he says to his father, The man warned us repeatedly, saying, You shall not see my face if your brother is not with you. Don't You're not getting into Egypt without Benjamin. So, if you send our brother with us, we'll go down, we'll buy food for you. But if you don't want to send him, we will not go down. Because the man said to us, you shall not see my face if your brother is not with you. I'm not interested in another confrontation with this strange fellow. He's a dictator. He's nuts. So if I follow through and bring Benjamin, it's one thing. But if you're not sending Benjamin, I'm not going down there. Verse 6. And Israel, another name for Jacob, says, Why have you harmed me? by telling the man that you have another brother. Why'd you tell him about Benjamin? Why'd you even bring it up? So they said, the man asked about us and about our family. He asked, is your father still alive? He asked, do you have a brother? And we told him, according to these words, we answered his questions. Could we have known that he would say, bring your brother down? Why would we suspect he would say that? We wanted to answer truthfully. Verse 8, and Judah says to Israel, his father, send the lad with me, and we will get up, and we will go, and we will live and not die, both we and you and also our young children. If we stay here or out of food, we all die from hunger. So you might as well take the chance. Send Benjamin with me, and let's try to save this. And verse 9, I will guarantee him. From my hand you can demand him. If I do not bring him to you and stand him up before you, I will have sinned against you forever. Notice he doesn't say you can kill my children. He just says you will hold it against me forever. Forever means not just in this lifetime, but in the world to come as well. And I'm not about to sacrifice my eternal resting place in heaven. I will bring Benjamin back no matter what. For had we not tarried, had you allowed us when we asked you to send Benjamin with us, by now we would have already returned twice. So stop wasting time and give in. Until you do, we are not going to go. Verse 11. So Israel, their father, said to them, If so, then do this. Follow my plan. Take some of the choice products of the land in your vessels and take down to the man as a gift. A little balm, a little honey, some wax, some lotus, some pistachios, some almonds. It's interesting that the last time Jacob sent a gift, he sent a gift to his brother Esau. And there he sent a very different type of gift. There he sent a lot, quantity. Here he's sending quality, hard to find items, things that you didn't get in Egypt. So I want you to collect all these hard to find items and you bring it to him as a gift. Because he's a prime minister, he doesn't need a lot of anything. He has all the money in the world. But hard to find items he would appreciate. And take double the money in your hands. 
and the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks you shall return in your hands. Perhaps it was an error. When you get there, you tell the accountant, by the way, we found this money in our sacks and we're returning it to you and we have additional money to buy food. You bring it up to them. Verse 13. And take your brother and get up and go back to the man. I'm giving you permission to take Benjamin. Verse 14. And may the Almighty God grant you compassion before the man. And he will release to you your other brother, Shimon, and Benjamin. And as for me, I am bereaved, I am bereaved. Just understand that every day until they're back, I will live in a state of panic. Verse 15, so the men took this gift and they took double the money in their hands and they took Benjamin and they got up and they went down to Egypt and they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, understand this is the first time he's seeing Benjamin. And Benjamin had nothing to do with his sale. He said to the overseer of his house, Bring the men into the house, into his private chambers, and give orders to slaughter an animal and to prepare it, for the men will eat with me at lunch. They're dining with me today. And the man did as Joseph had said, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Now these guys are frightened again. Why are we being brought to the prime minister's house? What did we do now? Now the men were frightened because they had been brought into Joseph's house. They don't know it's Joseph. And they said on account of the money, ah, this is the plot about the money that was returned in our sacks. On account of the money that came back in our sacks at first, we are brought to roll upon us and to fall upon us. They're going to attack us and to take us as slaves and they'll take our donkeys as well. So they drew near to the man who was over Joseph's house and they spoke to him at the entrance of the house before they were going in saying, we know what this is about. And they said, please, my Lord, we came down at first to purchase food. And it came to pass when we came to the lodging place that we opened our sacks and behold, each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. And we returned it here. Here's the money. Take it from us. And we brought down other money in our hands to purchase food. We're not here to steal anything from you. Here's the money back that we owed you from the first round. And here's the money for the second round. We don't know who put our money in our sacks. And the fellow that they're talking to said, Peace to you. Fear not. Your God and the God of your father gave you a treasure in your sacks. Your money came to me. As far as the ledger goes, you paid for. I, how did your money get back into your sacks? You guys have a God. That God does miracles. That God must have returned it to you. And he brought Shimon out to them. So now they have Shimon back. They still have Benjamin. They're told that they're forgiven about their money. And this, the prime minister wants to have lunch with them. Okay. They can let their guard down a little bit. They could be a little bit relieved. We got this. Tomorrow we're going home. We got the family back intact. We were able to purchase more wheat. We did everything on this mission. Mission accomplished. We're heading home tomorrow with new grain, new wheat to last us for a few months. Plus, we got this passport now from, from the prime minister that we can come anytime we want. Then the men brought the man brought the men to the, the brothers into Joseph's house. And he gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave fodder to the donkeys, and they prepared the gift until Joseph would come at lunchtime, for they heard that they would eat bread. Remember the gift that their father sent? They set it up on the table, all nice, waiting for the prime minister to enter. Verse 26. And Joseph came home, and they brought him the gift that was in their hands into the house, and they prostrated themselves to him to the ground. Again, the bowing takes place. This bowing, there's 11 of them. That was one of the dreams, that 11 stalks of wheat would bow. Right now, 11 stalks of wheat are bowing to him. Verse 27, he inquired after their welfare, and he said to them, Is your elderly father, whom you, me you mentioned, well, how's your father doing? Is he still alive? And they said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And they bowed and prostrated themselves. And he lifted his eyes and he saw Benjamin, his brother, 
the son of his mother. You understand how the verse is building the emotion now. And he said, is this your little brother whom you told me about? (laughs) Because he doesn't look so little. (laughs) And he said, may God favor you, my son. He blesses him. And Joseph hastened, for his mercy was stirred towards his brother. And he wanted to weep. He just wanted to break down and cry. So he went into another room, and he wept there. Again, a crying spell of Joseph. He sees Benjamin. He's talking to Benjamin. Verse 31, And he washed his face and came out, and he restrained himself and said, Serve the food. He didn't yet say, I am Joseph. Not yet. He held it back. He's got one more big test for them. And they set for him separately and for them separately and for the Egyptians who ate with them separately because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews because it's an abomination to the Egyptians. We see that all throughout the story of the Egyptians. They didn't like immigrants. They didn't like Hebrews who came from the other side of the Euphrates. You were a lower class citizen. And so they could not sit at the same table with them. So they set up a separate table for the Hebrews. Verse 33, here's again Joseph playing with them. They sat before him, the firstborn according to his age and the youngest according to his youth, and the men looked at each other in astonishment. So the commentaries help us a little bit with this verse. And this is what Joseph does. He tells them that he has this goblet. This goblet's going to play a role in the next chapter that we'll study next week. And he says, this goblet communicates with me and tells me things. It literally talks into my mind. And the goblet is going to tell me the seating order tonight. And he immediately looks at the 12 and he points to one, you will sit here. He points to the next, you will sit here. And the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. And he puts them in the exact order of their birth. Now, you can guess who's the oldest, perhaps, in the family and who's the youngest. But if you have 12, you're not always going to be right as to exact order, especially some of these were born pretty one after the next. And so they begin to start thinking, what's going on? How does this guy know so much? What's with this goblet? Verse 34. And he had portions brought to them from before him, and Benjamin's portion was five times as large as the portions of any of them. Again, another part of Joseph's plan here is he's going to show favoritism to Benjamin to see if that triggers jealousy amongst the brothers. Because when the father showed favoritism to Joseph, it triggered tremendous jealousy and hate. Have they done away with it? Are they able to overcome jealousy or not? And so he shows this favoritism to Benjamin. And they drank and they became intoxicated with him. They were in a good mood because they feel they're home free. This guy now likes us. He's a madman, but he likes us. He's treating us to dine with him in his own private place. And so they get drunk. They drink with him. All of this, again, is setting himself, setting up for the next part of the story. I look forward to seeing you all next Wednesday night as we continue the story of Joseph and his brothers. We do have a fascinating Zoom lecture this Monday evening at 7.30. Please do join us. Someone that was brought up in a secular environment, unfortunately he got into the world of drug deals and drug trading, and then he became a rapper. And then at some point in his life, he met his faith, his religion. He got involved in, in a Jewish way of life. And today he's a Chabad rabbi serving a community. So to hear the story from rapper to rabbi, this amazing journey, please join us Monday evening, 7.30. Go to jewishacademy.com and you'll get the Zoom link right there. It's free. Please pass on the information to others to join us for that. Thank you very much for uh, joining me tonight.